Perfect. Thanks very much. All right. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, for jumping on the uh, the session today. Uh, I know a number of you on um, on the, the who uh, are on the, the session right now and uh, also who registered. So um, for those uh, who I don't, I'm happy to to chat with you at any point if you have any questions. Uh, but um, my, just a, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Hartland Ross. I'm uh, president of eBridge Marketing. Uh, we are a um, marketing and M&A uh, boutique agency focused on the IT services space. Uh, we began as a marketing firm about uh, 20 years ago, working on IT, working with IT companies. Uh, specifically, uh, we focus on working with um, uh, data center providers, uh, infrastructure providers, hosting companies, and managed service providers, as well as the uh, the ISVs or vendors uh, to the ecosystem. And so, during that period of time, um, we've uh, certainly seen a lot of change. Uh, we built out our M&A practice as a result of client demand about 15 years ago with companies that were looking to grow a little bit more uh, quickly or uh, less uh, expensively in some cases than they could uh, with organic methods. And so uh, fast forward to today, and we have two sides of our business. We have our, um, our agency side and our M&A practice. And I spend more of my time on the M&A side, and today's session is really just a culmination of uh, some of the things that, that I've seen as um, I was kind of problematic um, with, with some of the transactions that, that have taken place over the years, or uh, in some cases, just sort of uh, uh, recognition of ways to make the process um, move a little bit more smoothly. So what I've done is uh, put together a number of things that um, are not necessarily in any kind of order, uh, but um, from my experiences, uh, make things a lot easier. So I'm uh, happy to, uh, to take any questions as, as we uh, go. I will try to uh, monitor the chat here um, as well, but um, if, if uh, we don't have time or you have to go, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me with any questions uh, you have. So my contact details are, are here. Uh, I'll leave them up for uh, a minute and um, uh, we'll probably be half an hour, 40 odd minutes, depending on how many questions that we have. So um, the, the first thing that uh, I think is important here is just to understand that the target business that you are uh, looking at, assuming that you have identified a target or two, is does this uh, business or will this business add strategic value to your existing business? So think about this in terms of uh, ultimately what your exit strategy is. How is this going to work together with your existing business? And, and think through uh, the people that you have, the team, the staff, um, is this new team, uh, does it come with the team, first of all? And if it does, is that team going to, to augment your existing team in some way? Um, how is the culture um, between the two groups going to work? Is that uh, going to be problematic? Um, does that make sense? Does it make sense to, to integrate them in some way? Does it make sense to kind of keep them as two uh, siloed operations? Uh, typically not. Typically you're looking for some kind of synergies to, uh, to take place, but uh, still questions to ask. Uh, the customer base. Uh, geographically, where are they located relative to your existing customers? Does that matter? Uh, typically for MSPs, it, it uh, has more um, of a, it's more of a factor than, than it might be for, for other businesses that uh, may be uh, even more uh, virtual than, than an MSP might be. And depending on the nature of services are provided uh, would uh, you know, dictate whether that's a relevant issue or not. Uh, what about the size of the customers? Are they um, enterprise, are they small business? Uh, do they have the same kind of expectations in terms of uh, levels of service, in terms of response time? Um, uh, in terms of uh, sort of scope of services, um, industry, um, is the industry similar to those that you're already servicing? Um, is it an industry, are there um, customers in industries that you want to be in? And, and do you have the, the skill sets, the relationships with vendors, um, et cetera, to be able to support um, those, uh, those customers in those industries? And if not, uh, does the target that you are looking at um, 
uh, acquiring, uh, did they have the, the relevant uh, skill sets to be able to, to kind of fast forward that, uh, that process for you? So uh, now you acquire the competencies, you understand the industry, you've got uh, perhaps relationships that are going to uh, come with this uh, new opportunity with existing vendors that uh, you'll be able to plug into. Are there any um, requirements uh, that these customers have in particular that you can't service? For example, 24 by seven support right now, you're not providing that or uh, language support or um, you know, particular custom work that will need to be done that's not going to fit nicely into the, the box uh, that you've got with the rest of your customers. And, and then of course, um, technology uh, platforms used, whether it be um, RMM tools, whether it be PSA uh, or, or other um, vendors that you've aligned yourself with, do you want to now be aligning yourself with an entirely new ecosystem? Is there overlap there? Uh, can they be migrated? Can they be moved uh, to, to the systems that you're using? Uh, what's that look like? Will it be impactful for the customers? Um, are the customers going to care? Uh, and some of these questions can be answered uh, by the seller in a lot of cases providing their opinion to say, look, that's not really going to be consequential either way, or yes, the customer does prefer to have their server in their back office or in this particular data center, or uh, that uh, they do want to be um, stay on in a VMware environment or, or whatever it is. So you, you'll have to uh, evaluate that on a sort of case by case basis. The nice thing with um, typically the, the transactions that, that we see with MSPs is that the customer base is, is not in the thousands. It's typically uh, you know, sub a couple hundred accounts type thing. So uh, you, uh, you'll be able to review these on, a, on an individual basis. So um, in terms of um, recurring revenue, um, you know, this really should be the focus. Uh, primarily, um, this, um, this will be, uh, or, or this, this is primarily uh, going to be, um, um, you know, uh, um, a, a, a part of um, hosting businesses and, and data centers, but with MSPs, uh, it may be a little bit uh, different. So uh, you need to look at what percentage of the customer base uh, is, is um, paying uh, some kind of recurring uh, fee for, for, for managed services. And so when you're looking at these, um, think that uh, the um, third party vendor uh, fees, like for example, uh, Microsoft 365, formerly Office 365, uh, those types of fees are not what you want ideally to be in included in the percentage of revenue that would be deemed to be recurring. Uh, what you're looking for is the percentage of revenue uh, that is associated with the services that are being provided, not the, uh, the, the vendor um, disbursement costs, uh, such as uh, I just uh, gave with uh, Microsoft 365. So uh, look at the recurring revenue percentage. Um, typically, we see most of our buyers wanting that number to be ideally 50% or more. Uh, I think that if you were to go down to the 25, 30%, that's probably about as low as you'd want to go. Um, there's certainly opportunities to be able to improve that, uh, not only in terms of moving some of the customers who aren't recurring uh, into some kind of recurring uh, management um, agreement, uh, but but also um, upselling those customers to uh, be able to uh, get additional value and move them into a different plan, et cetera. Uh, so you may be able to move, even if initially that number might be 25 or 30%, you might be able to move them up, but it is going to be a harder sale. So recognize that customers who, particularly if they've been uh, a long time more on a sort of break fix type model or pre-purchasing hours in advance, that type of thing, uh, it's going to be hard for them to, uh, to make the adjustment. And that's, again, a conversation that we need to be had with the seller to, to understand on a case-by-case -case basis uh, what percentage of these customers would uh, be willing to, to sign some kind of an agreement and, um, and be on a recurring plan. Um, have you got a defined process for your acquisitions? And so these are going to be things like, have you got pre-prepared questions um, in, um, in, in done in advance for your, your due diligence process? Um, have you got a technical team in place? Or perhaps that's you yourself, but in any event, is there a lead uh, person who can take that role? Um, primarily, the 
focus on these transactions tends to be uh, on the financial side and on the uh, technical uh, slash operational side. Uh, but nonetheless, um, they're all going to be important. You're going to need to look at uh, legal uh, implications as well. Uh, so to, to understand uh, these different components, to be able to have a, a prepared list of questions in advance so that uh, you aren't sort of winging it in the, uh, in, the, in the opportunity and in the eyes of the seller and you look like you know what you're doing. Now, of course, if you've done this before and you have the process nailed down, well, uh, that's uh, just so much the better. But uh, ensuring that you have a process and at the same time, I would go so far as to say not too far the other way, which is here's our uh, 30 pages of pre-prepared questions for a transaction that's a million dollars. The seller is simply going to uh, go with gravity and uh, go with another buyer that has um, uh, you know, a one page uh, set of questions uh, or questions that uh, perhaps in some cases they might be able to figure out themselves in due diligence rather than making the seller prepare a lot of uh, different reports and, uh, and whatnot. So have a process, understand uh, who on your team is leading which parts of it, uh, but at the same time, uh, not be uh, overwhelming. Um, also, uh, make sure you have thought in advance about whether you're going to be doing a, an asset deal or a stock deal. Um, generally speaking, the vast majority of these types of transactions at this size in this industry are going to be asset transactions uh, versus stock transactions. So. Um, just to be clear, what I'm talking about here is, are you purchasing the shares of the company, which means you're also accepting all of the, the liabilities that might exist, tax liabilities, vendor liabilities, uh, legal liabilities, et cetera, um, or are you simply purchasing the assets, which is the goodwill, the customer base, uh, the, the websites, and um, you know, in, in the event that there's any sort of physical assets, either equipment or maybe there's an office or something. But uh, most of them, uh, as I say, are done as an asset transaction. Stock deals take longer generally, they're more complicated, and there's more due diligence, and there's more risk. Uh, so uh, just uh, bear that in mind and be clear. Sometimes a seller will have a preference, sometimes they won't, uh, but uh, you should have thought through the, the pros and cons on both. And there are advantages uh, certainly to both. Uh, and also, do you have, um, uh, speaking of financial components, do you have a um, CPA who's uh, in, your, in your team as well who can support um, your uh, financial questions and help you with some of that due diligence? Um, so moving on, um, are you willing to compete for opportunities? So uh, is there some kind of uh, strategic fit here, something where it's an opportunity where it makes sense to, to uh, potentially uh, pay a little bit more uh, than you might feel otherwise comfortable doing? And I'll give you some examples. So if there are um, situations where you're not the only bidder and you really see this as a good opportunity, and that the opportunity cost of you rebuilding or recreating uh, what the seller has already built is now going to take six months, a year, two years. Uh, what is that worth to you? Uh, so if you have to do this yourself and build it organically uh, and they've uh, got some kind of a turnkey operation, um, and then um, it's one thing to say, well, this deal's not the right one or it's getting too expensive. I'll just uh, quickly uh, flip over and uh, start talking to uh, you know, another seller. Um, that may be the case. It depends on which market you're in, but if it's a, uh, especially if it's more of a secondary or tertiary market, so these are going to be um, not uh, you know, Los Angeles or Chicago or, or Atlanta or something. These are going to be smaller markets. There may not be so many opportunities and it may make sense to try to work something out. So uh, that's just a, a consideration. That, um, that you should think about. So what's an ideal uh, price to make it work, but at the same time, kind of what's your, what's your stretch number? Uh, so growth, um, can you grow the business? And, and if so, uh, what would you um, how would you plan on doing that? And if you uh, talk to a lot of sellers uh, and you say, well, you know, why is it that you've been flat or why is it that you've declined or, is, or perhaps grown but not grown by very much? Uh, what's going on? The often uh, cited answer from the seller is, well, I haven't really done uh, much in the way of marketing. I'm not very good at it, or I haven't had much time. Uh, but if uh, you were able to come in and, um, and you know, uh, strike up a, a Google campaign or do some other marketing, uh, then things will turn around and this is a great business and you'll be able to, to grow it uh, um, you know, uh, 
exponentially. And uh, the reality is, is that uh, chances are the seller has tried this at some point, if not recently, and failed themselves. So clearly what they were doing wasn't working. Uh, chances are they may not uh, and, and probably didn't know what they were doing. Uh, but just be careful in terms of uh, uh, hearing the response of why they're not growing is because uh, they just simply haven't done any marketing and that, that's the, the simple uh, um, kind of uh, magic pill. So uh, understand what, what you might be able to do to be able to grow that customer base. Um, so it's um, the existing customer base, and I'll talk about upsells a little bit further here uh, down, but, um, but also uh, growing in that market in terms of uh, you know, how much penetration is there, how much competition is there, uh, what were the uh, obstacles from a sales perspective that the sellers uh, run into, et cetera. Um, in terms of actually uh, striking an, an, an offer, uh, proposing uh, in different structures, um, are there any other benefits that you can add to your offer that will make it more attractive to the seller? And a lot of times these deals are not uh, simply won or lost based on, on uh, the, the financial components. And certainly in, in almost all cases, it's, uh, it's somewhere between extremely important to the most important, uh, but it's not always the defining factor. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, is it possible that um, you may be able to give employment opportunities to the, the existing team uh, that's working for the, the seller right now, the, 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 um, the staff? Um, it may be that the seller has got a great relationship with that team, they've been very loyal, and they feel that they want to make sure that, that their, their team uh, is taken care of and that they helped them get that far over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they wanna make sure that uh, they have a soft landing and they're not out of jobs. And so to the extent that you might be able to provide that to that team and another buyer is not able to provide that or doesn't want to for one reason or another, uh, that might be a tipping point for them, for example. Uh, another related point is, is there an opportunity for you uh, to be able to offer them um, um, some kind of role uh, going forward. And I'll talk uh, about that again in a, in a moment here as well, but uh, certainly a related point. So to the extent that you can do this, we'll really give the, the staff a, a soft landing uh, for them. And also um, if there's um, uh, an employment uh, opportunity um, for, uh, for the, um, the for the seller, um, and then uh, you might be able to offset some of the um, cash that you would otherwise pay up front uh, because uh, you're essentially now going to have the uh, seller part of your team. And of course, you want them part of the team as a transition uh, for the transition period anyway. Um, but to the extent that you can get them to uh, stay on for a year or two or three, uh, especially if they're looking to retire, this is going to give them a soft landing as well. And we'll probably uh, give the seller uh, more confidence to receive less cash um, up front that they might otherwise uh, want if um, they were not a continued part of the business. This way, if they're staying on, they have more visibility into how the business is being run. Uh, they would still have relationships with the, their customers and be able to uh, provide um, um, that sort of uh, warm handover to you as, as the buyer. Um, some other things that you can do, you could provide referral fees. Um, we've certainly seen uh, cases in the past where the seller uh, has uh, gone on and started uh, or already uh, started a business that's related. And for instance, maybe they're um, uh, some sort of an ISV at that point and they've uh, used the technology within their own business. Now uh, you may wish to continue paying them as a vendor and, uh, and, they, and continue to use their, their the intellectual property because perhaps that wasn't part of the transaction. Um, or uh, there's some kind of referral fees for the seller who maybe tapped, well tapped into an existing uh, industry or, or network associations where they continue to provide uh, referrals. And so uh, it's critical that you maintain a strong relationship with those sellers so that uh, some of that, uh, that business can uh, be maintained. Those, those uh, leads, uh, et cetera, come in and you provide a, a referral structure for, uh, for the seller. Um, the, the next point is related to trust, and I think this is, uh, uh, I think, an often overlooked uh, piece where, where trust is really one of the 
uh, main um, uh, components of these transactions. Not really discussed that much, but there's this underlying feeling on both sides is, hey, as a seller, do I trust that this buyer is, is competent, is capable of taking over my business? Uh, and, and of course, obviously, uh, are they um, going to pay me? Am I going to get the, the, uh, not only the, the, the payment of clothes, but more importantly, probably the ones that concern are the future payments, whether they're tied to an earnout or just simply tied to uh, some kind of note or schedule. Um, are they going to get paid? And so it's important that as you go through the process, recognizing that there are ways where uh, trust can be broken or, or damaged. And if that continues to happen and erode that, that confidence of the seller, um, the seller may decide uh, to walk. And, and of course, this goes both ways as well. But uh, one example, for, for instance, is deviating from the initial terms of, of a term sheet. So you put together an offer. And the offer has the, the, um, the, the payment terms, it has the support that's going to be needed um, from the uh, seller in terms of their, their time, the number of uh, months, the number of hours a week, if they're going to get paid for that, how they're going to get paid, um, their staff, um, <clears throat> are they going to keep the office, uh, um, not keep the office, uh, keep the employees, not move the customers. Etc. So these are all going to be outlined in the term sheet or letter of intent, if you like. And so it, once you get into due diligence, obviously what you're looking to do is confirm what you've already been provided initially as, as part of the materials. And now you're going to take a deeper dive and probably bring in your, your team, your um, CPA, and, and perhaps members of your team to help with that process. And you're, of course, looking to verify what you've already been provided. Uh, but if you do find in situations where they're at odds with what was originally discussed, uh, then uh, there needs to be a conversation. And so long as there's a justification for um, making adjustments to the original structure based on new information being discovered, that's fine. But if you are feeling like now's the time I've got them kind of under this no shop, um, in other words, they can't talk to other uh, buyers and you feel you've got a bit of leverage and you want to change the nature of the deal, um, now that's uh, playing uh, bad uh, or poor pool. And so as a result, um, you, you're going to do some damage to, to the trust of the seller. And the last thing you want to do, particularly if the seller is going to be a part of your team uh, for some transition period, is to have them um, uh, feel that uh, they, don't, they don't have confidence in you. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, that's going to uh, have implications for the ability for them to kind of get behind you and support uh, their old customers in terms of um, um, any kind of transition and questions that, that arise. Um, you want them to, to kind of essentially have your back and um, um, uh, your, uh, lead to a, a more um, seamless uh, transition. Um, also, uh, in terms of uh, trust, if you can cite some other examples of, of uh, transactions that you've completed, uh, if you haven't completed any other acquisitions, obviously that's not going to, to work, but there may be instances where you could um, cite examples of supporting existing technologies or customers. You've done a migration, taken over customer base, you've worked with similar businesses yourself to, to, to do exactly what uh, you're, you're intending to do here, perhaps uh, you know, on a smaller scale, but nonetheless, there's uh, um, ability for you to display some, some uh, prior competence and, and provide you know, references uh, to uh, a prospective seller. Um, next point is, um, will the owner or, or management team stay on? And so we've talked a little bit about this in different ways as it relates to some other points, but uh, there should be a transition support period. And uh, often get the question of, well, how long should this be? How long should the person uh, stay on for? And there's no uh, magic answer to this or magic bullet, but generally speaking, we suggest that uh, this be a, a minimum of, of 90 days, ideally uh, at least 180 days. And if there's an ability to provide that soft landing uh, for the seller and uh, integrate them into your business, assuming that they're adding value uh, in some capacity and not redundant, uh, and then uh, you know if you keep them on for a year or two or three, uh, then then you know all all the power to you and, and to them. Uh, however, there's some um, another important caveat here, which is to say that the seller uh, has historically been used to running the show. 
they've been signing um, contracts with vendors, they've been uh, directing their staff, they make decisions, et cetera, and that's now gonna change. Uh, you as the owner are gonna be the one in charge, you're gonna be the one who's gonna have to sign off on uh, new expenditures, and so it's important that there be a very um, candid conversation with the seller to say, look, you're gonna stay on, uh, but this, this is, uh, uh, these are your responsibilities and this is the extent to which you have you know, authority over making decisions and whatever those things are. But um, we've seen situations before where the seller uh, continues on and they're signing new um, you know, vendor contracts and whatnot are obligating the company when when they're not authorized to do that and, and also providing a directive to the team the staff the, and perhaps uh, their old team and maybe uh, the new members of the team um, to uh, to do things that uh, again are not necessarily aligned with, with uh, new ownership as you as a buyer um, so you um, you really want this the seller to be able to provide this kind of warm handoff as I mentioned provide an endorsement to the new owner and uh, so they should be involved in those uh, initial introductions uh, when they when it's taken over um, and, and, and again you know uh, speaking to the point earlier with trust uh, this is where this is uh, key uh, next point just Recognize that you're you're buying a customer base, right? You're buying a, a revenue stream, you're buying people, and you're buying systems, and you're wanting to achieve efficiencies in doing that. And so, when you're looking at opportunities, uh, try to determine where there's going to be cost savings. Who, you know, as I said, talking about uh, retaining staff is great, uh, but you certainly don't need two people doing administration or two people doing marketing or, or billing or whatnot. So um, can you repurpose some of those people? Um, but um, you, you are buying a, re uh, a recurring revenue uh, stream, an asset, uh, and you want that to carry forward into the future. And so to the extent that you can upsell those customers and reduce costs, um, that's really the, the name of the game here. And uh, uh, this has got these, these pieces have all got to work together to, to, to add value to your existing business. So try not to get uh, caught up in the emotional aspects of this and uh, identify whether uh, you know, uh, there's actually um, synergies to, to be realized. Um, next point is, uh, is just, uh, I refer to this as rocking the boat. Um, when, when you do a transaction, obviously there are going to be changes. There are going to be changes internally and changes externally to the customer base. Uh, my suggestion generally is to rock the boat as little as possible after a closing. So there may be a tendency to get a press release out and announce uh, ownership change on day one. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, I find that it um, uh, puts doubt and creates questions in the minds of the customers. And who is this new group? Are they gonna be competent? Are they going to um, ha handle my account? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, competently, uh, what about the new team? I used to deal with uh, Gary and he was always my, my support guy, my go-to person, and now uh, Gary's no longer there, or maybe Gary's there, but he's, he's uh, not necessarily as readily available as he used to be. Uh, so uh, try not to rock the boat. And so these are going to be things like changing billing addresses, changing billing details, uh, pricing, um, payment processes, um, payment terms, uh, service level agreements, uh, the contracts. I'm not saying you can't change these things. I'm just saying don't do it all on day one. So try to keep things as status quo as possible. I did talk earlier about getting the um, seller to provide a warm handoff, the introductions, and of course you're gonna need to do that, but again, I wouldn't suggest doing it on day one to the extent that the um, customers had been in control uh, by the new buyer for several months, uh, and then uh, there'd be a, or, or even, even a month, uh, and then there'd be a uh, introduction uh, by the uh, seller. Uh, at that point, it's, hey, We've already been in control for for 30, 60, 90 days. There, you know, there's been no change. Uh, it's just now your point of contact is going to be different. And so at that point, their customer is going to be a little disarmed and feel that okay, well, I guess it's uh, it's, it's already been some period of time, and I don't I haven't noticed any differences. In fact, I've noticed uh, some improvements in some aspects. Uh, and then they're going to feel more confident. 
Um, another thing you might do, um, I talked about externally and internally. So um, externally, of course, is the customer base, but internally is, is for the employees of staff that you retain, assuming you do retain some of them. And so if possible, try to provide them with better terms uh, than the seller was offering. So it may be a salary increase, it may be a, a, um, a gas allowance, it might be a sick days, it might be a, um, um, you know, some other uh, ability, whether it's a you know office environment, uh, work from home, whatever it is, but try to provide some improvements for the employees as well. Again, it's a gesture of good faith, and you know, as just as much as trust is important working with the seller, it's also really critical for the employees as well uh, to feel that uh, they're they're in a, a, a stable um, environment and uh, that their job is going to be on the line uh, here if um, you know. With, with too many changes and, and uncertainty. Um, I mentioned uh, this next point earlier uh, about upselling. So, so how easily can the customers be upsold or cross-sold? And it's, it's harder uh, initially uh, as a new buyer because the perception is, well, you're a new buyer, you don't have the they don't have the trust and, and, and history with the customers. And so the perception is, is that, well, look, they're just trying to sell me to, um, as, as any new company would, they raise the prices and change the terms and the service isn't as good. And they're just trying to extract more value from me. And I trust uh, the old seller and the relationship I had with Gary before, and, and now this is all changing. So my suggestion again, is to not change too much too quickly, um, but to, certainly to understand from um, our conversations with the seller as part of due diligence in terms of which customers have the um, uh, ability to be upsold, which ones might be open to it, which ones probably wouldn't. They may be uh, known financial hardships, constraints, especially now with COVID, um, or uh, it, it just may be that uh, really it's a simplistic operation and you're providing really as much value as, as uh, the customer really needs at this point. But going through those on a case-by-case -case basis, identifying the opportunities and then approaching them, but just not doing it all on, uh, on day one. And you know, one um, uh, scenario that we see oftentimes is that their uh, managed service provider might be providing some level of service, um, but they've really come in and sort of plugged one hole uh, rather than um, providing more of a holistic um, solution. And so if services have been provided in sort of isolation and not um, looking at, at the business as a whole and trying to solve uh, business challenges, uh, certainly there may be opportunities for you to, to do more of a fact-finding expedition and, and try to uh, upsell some of these um, uh, customers. And last one um, is, is, is and it sort of speaks to the point earlier about um, uh, trust, but really consider what's fair. And, and fairness creates a, a supportive uh, seller, a supportive environment. Um, it will uh, help uh, with referrals. And as we, as we talked about, and, and candidly will provide less stress and just be easier for you for the inevitable process of what will end up being uh, very much of a give and take. Uh, as, as these transactions unfold, and there will be uh, instances where uh, even if it breaks a, a contractual arrangement on one side or the other, uh, there's going to be, as long as it's not too significant, there's going to be some uh, recognition and, and understanding uh, on both sides. So, for example, if a customer were to uh, leave um, uh, after close, well, Who's, who, what, what's the situation there? So if there's an earnout, uh, clearly they won't be compensated for that. But what if the customer left simply as a result of the seller, I'm sorry, excuse me, of the buyer uh, dropping the ball and support isn't as good now as it was before. So if the seller recognizes that there was some outage or that they significantly dropped the ball and that was the reason that the, sell, that the customer left, um, is it, does it make sense to, to not pay the, the seller for that? And contractually, um, that, you know, there may be an answer, easy answer to that, uh, but there's also a question of what's fair. And, uh, and, and likewise, if the customer was teetering on the edge of leaving before the, the transaction completed, uh, and then one um, small thing, uh, you know, it was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back that the um, buyer has done and the seller now leaves, uh, you know, whose fault is it again? So, you know, these are the types of things that we see and uh, you can have it drawn up, but uh, it's, it ends up being not oftentimes quite so black and white. Um, if the seller is gonna be part of the transition support agreement, 
um, and then uh, you want to make sure that they're looking out for your best interests. And so, to, again, to the extent that they feel trust, there's trust there and, and fairness, um, they're not just going to be showing up every day out of contractual obligations like, hey, I was supposed to be here for 90 days or 180 days, um, whether they're being paid or not. Um, and I'm just sort of fulfilling my obligations as part of the, the purchase agreement, um, but rather actually um, having a vested interest in ensuring that customers stay on and, and have a good experience. So just recognize that this relationship will not end on the day of close and that there's going to be some period of time. Uh, and, and so uh, as you're negotiating, you, you may um, uh, choose to sort of pick your battles, I guess, is maybe a good way to put it. So that, those are some of the um, major uh, things that we've seen over the years uh, that have come up in, in transactions. And um, uh, if you uh, want a, a copy of this uh, deck, uh, it'll be, it's being recorded. And if you have any questions um, for me, uh, please feel free to, to reach out. Uh, my email address is, uh, is there. Um, I can also be reached at uh, area code 604-987. 5530 if you'd like to call me I should put that on the slide and uh, if you are interested in receiving um, opportunities of companies for sale or you know anybody who might be interested in being on our list um, please uh, check out our site hostbroker.com or the mspbroker.com and you can sign up for our listings which come out weekly uh, these are um, uh, opportunities of IT firms for sale only, uh, MSPs, uh, hosting companies, data centers, and infrastructure providers. Um, we also have a blog, which uh, you're welcome to check out, and um, has uh, resources there. So if you have any questions, um, I'm uh, happy to chat. And um, with that, I think um, I will uh, end the uh, end the presentation. So thank you very much for everybody for your time today, and uh, have a great uh, uh, weekend. And wish you all well, and, and stay safe. Bye now.